So uh, this is a talk on introducing developers to algorithmic trading. Uh, since it is about algorithmic trading, a few disclaimers. One, I'm representing myself, not my company that I work for. And uh, all the opinions are my own. And there's, uh, you know, we'll talk a bit about investments and strategies, but there's no offer to sell anything or soliciting you to buy something from me. And don't take any of this as an investment advice, like you should go out and buy this stock or that stock and, uh, or a recommendation of any kind. Um, a little bit about me. I've been uh, coding for about 15 years. I've been trading for about 11. I work as an architect in this industry uh, by day, and at night I like to do quantitative research and, uh, and trade. And if you ever want to get a hold of me, the best way to do that is uh, probably on Twitter. Uh, so why am I giving this talk? One, uh, this has always been a field that's mired in uh, sort of mystery, to, and, uh, and finance in general has a lot of uh, different like jargon. And so my goal is to make this more accessible. Um, I also want to uh, impress upon you that it's a really fun and rewarding project. If you like really interesting data science-like problems, this is interesting because uh, unlike uh, maybe natural science where you do anal analysis and the state of things should stay the same, with finance as a social and economic things in general, uh, the environment's always changing. So you're kind of like trying to solve a problem that's, uh, uh, you know, or solve a puzzle that's constantly changing. So that's very, can be very interesting. Um, and most importantly, uh, investing, you know, has a lot of risk in it. And I've heard a lot of horror stories about people um, writing code and trading their own money or even worse borrowing money from family members and it going very poorly so I really want to share a process with you like this is you know a good way to get started and, a, and a, hopefully a safer way to uh, get up and running so what is algorithmic trading it's really simple in, in what we're actually doing we're just automating the selection of what we're going to invest in and then we're automating the actual execution of doing that investment it's not a replacement for good financial advice. You know, uh, if you get into investing, one of the things you realize are costs and taxes are some of the biggest impacts on uh, your returns and your success financially. It's really good to get financial advice for those things. Our, our Python code is probably not going to solve those issues. Um, if done correctly, it's a build wealth slowly system. Um, if done incorrectly, it's a get poor quickly system. <laughs> So we want to do it well. Um, it, we're automating investing. We're not you know, coming up with some silver bullet that's going to all make us rich. So it, one thing I tell people is if that's your motivation, if you're really into this idea of like, oh my gosh, I'm going to make all this money and, you know, and things are going to be wonderful, this is probably not the thing for you. There's a lot more fruitful things you could do if you're really passionate about something, if your interests are the monetary rewards. Um, so uh, this is not a good motivation for algorithmic trading. Now, we're all very good developers, and we know that you don't write code in production. We don't write code in ship. But strangely enough, the stories I've heard over the years are people who go into a trading system, they write code, and they hit run. And don't do that. That's, just, uh, it's, it's, that's usually one of the common themes in the horror stories I've heard. Really, a good process is to say, hey, I have an idea. You know, maybe, uh, you know, there's some good economic foundation to it. Maybe it's, you know, hey, I really believe in investing in things or companies that, you know, align with my social beliefs or maybe my religious beliefs. Um, so I'm going to do some research on that. And once you do some research, you then start writing some code. And then you want to get a set of data and say, hey, look, if I had invested this way for X number of years, how would I have done? That's your first step. That's your historical what if back test. And then, since you know, a lot of us are new to the field, uh, we, we still don't go live. We do what's called paper trading. And a lot of brokerages will give you a practice account. Because even when you do historical analysis and say, hey, that looks good, I like that, um, the reality of, you know, hey, how would this actually work in real life? It's good to practice those things before you commit your own money. If you make it through those three steps, then I would say ship, run, you know, you, you should give it a, a, a try. So I am an architect, so I could not give a presentation without drawing some arrows and boxes. And so the basic idea of what we're building here is we have our program that's going to get in some data 
Uh, almost always that includes market data of like prices and time series of trades and some other data which sometimes and typically includes some sort of company financials or the fundamental uh, economic data about the thing you're investing in. But it really can be anything that you find uh, to be relevant. One of the cooler things I've uh, read recently was there was a, a, a group of folks who were taking satellite images of oil containers and measuring the shadow of the depth of the tanker to see, you know, hey, is there a lot of oil in there or not a lot of oil in there, and trying to predict uh, oil prices based on the uh, satellite images that they thought predicted supply. So it really can be anything. Uh, we were talking with a few folks who are in the room today uh, about using Twitter and sentiment data. Uh, that's also a very uh, common thing to do. Uh, you know, so it's really whatever your imagination you, you know, can think of. So what's in the box? Um, I really wanted to find some great clip art or meme for this, and I couldn't. And so I've been a little obsessed with Bitmojis lately. So, uh, so hopefully that helps you know, uh, make the point of what this is. There's really a couple core things that if you check all the boxes that your program has, these things are probably in a good spot. Um, oftentimes, uh, these two, the risk model and the transaction cost, are the ones that are forgotten. And arguably, they're, they're probably the most important ones. Um, so of course, you have data handlers that you really want to build for reliability that make sure you're collecting your data in a timely manner and accurately. And then the most popular and arguably one of the more fun things to write is the alpha model. This is your signal that says, hey, this event has happened. This is what I was researching. I should take some investment action. You know, so it's saying, buy this, sell this, buy this, sell that. But you need to balance that out with a good risk model. You know, just like your mother probably taught you when you're younger, you don't put all your eggs in one basket. This alpha model is going to say, just buy this, sell this. It's not really thinking about what's the right, rational, sensible thing to do. You need to write that code in. Um, you know, hey, do I actually have enough money in the account to do that? You know, like, it's usually the risk model at its most low level is really simple things that you should be, you know, sensible. Like, you just want to think about what could possibly go wrong and then write code to make sure that, you know, you're protected from that. And then transaction costs are really important. That's typically when you're getting started is just uh, commissions. You know, your broker is going to charge you per trade and you need to take that into account. Um, and then, of course, you need something that's going to manage all your orders going out to the market, them coming back and saying, yes, I filled that, or no, I couldn't find any buyers or sellers. You didn't, it, the, the thing didn't happen. Your investment action did not happen. So those are the core things that you need to make sure you're coding for. Now, one of the other important things to understand is there's this difference between high-frequency trading and low-frequency trading. I specialize and care more about low-frequency trading. I think it's really important to know the difference. So in high-frequency trading, uh, the, as programmers, we really need to, the first and most important thing is the data time frame. Uh, high-frequency trading, they care about sub-second. Uh, like a lot of the vendors in that space will quote their equipment or their programs in nanoseconds, which is unbelievable, you know, how lightning fast things have to be in that space. Low frequency trading, at most we're really talking about writing code that operates on a sub-minute basis. It's got to execute its event loop at least at, uh, at that fast. Uh, cost, obviously, uh, very different. It's very expensive to write systems and create systems that operate at a high frequency. Um, and the software we use is very different. In the high frequency space, we're doing a lot of C++, GPU programming, kernel optimization, uh, really low level network programming. In low frequency space, Python is very popular, uh, which is awesome. Uh, there's also still a lot of R and still some MATLAB. Uh, Julia is starting to gain interest in this space. Uh, uh, there's still some Java and C Sharp stuff, but not so much new stuff. Because really, Python's great. <laughs> um, and then hardware, you know, uh, with high frequency, they're getting their servers in the exchange's data center, and they're co-locating. They're using microwave networks between cities to cut down on latency. And they're programming uh, FPGA boards to actually get their strategies to go even faster. It's just really, I mean, if you're really into the, that sort of technical stack, it's a really cool place to be. That's not me. Uh, I prefer, you know, hey, can I write something in Python, do some research, deploy it, and you know, go have dinner. You know, so that, that's kind of more my thing. 
Um, but why Python? As we all know, and we're all here, there's a wonderful community of support. There's a breadth of libraries. And it really covers the full stack of what you need to do this type of application. Uh, this is a great slide uh, from uh, Jake Vanderplas. Uh, uh, he gave it at PyData in New York, I think, in 2015. And I just love it because it really shows how, on top of Python, we started to get some of the uh, core tooling. Then we got some of the scientific and graphing uh, libraries. And then on top of that, you started getting things like machine learning and graphing and image processing and Bayesian. Uh, and th that really provided the full stack of what we in the quantitative finance uh, space would need to start building libraries of our own that are very finance focused. And so ever since that kind of came into place, there's been a lot of work in the open source community for algorithmic trading, and it's really been wonderful. So for those of you who want to get started, you don't have to go through the pain I went through 10, 11 years ago to build a lot of this stuff yourself. I mean, my first system was written in C Sharp with Microsoft SQL Server, and I had to get all my own data, and I had to learn a lot of these things on my own, and it was just painful. Today, you have a number of things. What, Quantopian is probably my favorite. Um, good people, they've done a wonderful job with their platform. And instead of going through a lot of demos today on their platform, I'm actually going to try to give you a little bit more of a tour of it, because I think that's maybe a better uh, fit for the, the 30 minutes we have today. Um, so I'm actually going to start showing you their platform, which uh, is extremely well documented. If you come out here, you can create an account for free. Um, and what it, they've essentially done is they've created a research environment. So there's an IPython or a Jupyter Notebook-like environment out here where you can do research. And they've created an online development environment where you can actually write algorithms. And they've done a really good job documenting what is this stuff, giving code to show how to do some of these things. Um, in the slides I have in my deck uh, that we'll go through in a moment, I also go through some of these basic lessons. And I have some comments that try to define some of the jargon uh, that is often in, uh, uh, found in the, these programs in finance. One of, for example, one of the common things is a security. Uh, in our space, uh, in finance, developers here, security, we always have to ask, are you talking about securing the system or the fact that we call stocks and bonds and all this stuff securities? Why do we call it that? Eh, it doesn't really matter. It's just another layer of jargon we have to cut through to understand uh, really what's going on here. Uh, so this is really well documented. And uh, they also have a very nice help page. Uh, they do have a research environment. It is a freemium model. The hardest part when I built my system was getting the data, not writing the code. Uh, and so Quantopian gives you a lot of free data, and there's also data you can pay for if you're really, uh, if you want to, if you're interested in, in, in that. And the other thing they've done that I'm really a big fan of is um, a lot of developers don't come from a natural science or statistics background. Um, so that becomes another layer, another barrier to people getting into this. They have done a really nice job putting together um, a lecture series, uh, which if you go through them, they go through, uh, and I, I have gone through them, so I can say, you know, these are, these are definitely uh, done quite well to get you going. Uh, introduction to the research, introduction to Python, uh, NumPy, Pandas, plotting, and they're basically cumulatively building up to the point where you can even do uh, your own strategy and see how all these techniques and tools come together. Um, a lot of them, simply you click on them and you can clone the notebook to your own research environment tied to your free login. Or, and some of them have YouTube videos where uh, the, the person who put it together uh, actually well, walked through it. So like if I clone this, it copies it to my research environment and I can read through, um, you know, what are you trying to teach me? And I, you know, just if you've ever used Jupyter, um, it, it's very similar, the, the commands are uh, to run and uh, go through uh, all the things that are here. So I'd highly encourage you to check that out. Um, so now, uh, checking in on time, I think what I'm going to do is I, I'm going to talk through these demos. Uh, and then hopefully if we have time at the end, I'd actually like to demo something for you. 
Um, so the first thing you need to understand about any algorithmic trading program, and I'm just realizing how bad that looks on the screen. I, I'm, let me see if I can make that any bigger. Uh, oh, not out. How about in? That's uh, unfortunately as good as it's going to get. So um, I will put these slides up online afterwards, and hopefully that will help. Uh, so with every program, the most basic sense, and this is code that would actually run in Quantopian's uh, uh, environment, you have to initialize your algorithm, say, hey, I, these are the things I'm going to invest in, or these are the data I need to set up the program. Um, and then you start scheduling things that will handle data on some frequency. So in Quantopian, uh, they have this handle data method that's called every minute, and you take some action. You run some analysis, and you make some investment decision. Um, they have a data object, which is a, uh, allows you to very easily get historical data. And once you do that, you're basically getting pandas series, pandas data frames, and in some cases, pandas panels back that you're allowed to then slice and dice and do uh, some analysis with. Um, I'll skip that. Uh, oftentimes, you will want to schedule uh, a function. Um, in finance, uh, we, in low frequency, we typically uh, make uh, larger investment decisions on a daily, weekly, or monthly uh, basis, typically saying, hey, things have shifted a certain way. I'm going to rebalance my account to do this. And so the, uh, a lot of platforms, including Quantopian, will give you uh, the ability to, to schedule uh, functions to happen at certain times. And then you need to start, once you've understood like that's the structure of the program, you know, I need to initialize, I need to schedule some things to happen, I need to be able to process data. Then you need to start understanding some of the finance guts of what's going on here. And so the first thing we need to understand is that, uh, you know, this term called a uh, portfolio, positions, and holdings. So a portfolio is basically your account. I don't know why I don't just say your account, you know, it's, this is my account. It has money in it. That's it. You know, the positions I have are the things that I've either bought or sold. Either I, for example, bought Microsoft, so I hold Microsoft's stock, or I could have sold Microsoft without buying it first, so now I am short Microsoft with the hope that it's going to go down and I'm going to buy it back or cover when it's lower. So these are some of the terms you're going to see, and you're going to see them in things uh, like uh, uh, Quantopian, where you have uh, the ability to access your portfolio, dot, the positions in it, and now you have an iterable collection of all the holdings in there. So you start to build this con uh, contextual framework of how this works, and you start, the code starts to make a little bit more sense. No, you get it. Well, so when your research, hopefully your platform, your research platform has the data, so it's providing you the API to get all the data. And then if you're trading live, your broker is going to give that through their API. Mm -hmm. You can totally do that. So um, uh, there are, I'm totally uh, spacing on it a bit. But um, Yodely is a good example of a way to say, hey, I have an account over here. I want to get information about my account. They have a really nice RESTful API for hooking into a different financial institution and pulling that data in. So exactly. So yep. Uh, so in theory, you could have an account at Schwab, as you mentioned, and say, hey, you know, I want to write some Python code that monitors my investments at Schwab. So maybe I use Yodely to say, all right, I'm going to go get that data through a RESTful API. You write some Python code to do something with that. Yeah. This demo um, is probably one of my favorites to show people. Um, and so I, while it's kind of hard to see, there's one algorithm up here. I'm going to duck down. This is so everyone can see. And there's another algorithm over here. And the only difference is one line of code. You remember how I told you the risk model is the most often forgotten thing? This is a great example. If you run this for two days and you start with $1,000, you don't make it out of the first day without owing your broker $15,000. So really important point. You can lose more money than you have trading in the markets. And if you don't include basic risk controls like making sure that 
you don't already have an order in the market for that security and that you're not creating a duplicate or making sure that it's actually available to trade and the orders aren't queuing up, um, which is what this one line of code uh, essentially does, you, uh, you can have really bad things happen. So, so risk modeling, uh, I'm sorry, risk, uh, uh, risk controls are extremely important and sometimes they're as easy as one line of code. And as, in other words, uh, one line of code in this case can save you thousands of dollars. So that's really, uh, really, really important uh, to understand how you're uh, testing and managing risk. Uh, I did try to describe here how you model for transaction costs. Basically, you want to understand how your broker is going to charge commissions and include that in your, uh, your uh, uh, back testing. Um, so the basic hello world in this space is something called a moving average cross. It's basically uh, saying, you know, we have a time series of data and we're going to do a moving average of how, what does that data look like. We'll take a longer one that moves slower and a faster one and when they cross, we're going to do something. It's the basic hello world. And uh, this one I think uh, we are going to try to try to do because I think we have time. Uh, so actually I think I already set this up. So I'm going to go back to Quantopian. I'm going to go to my algorithms. So this is their development environment where I can create a new algorithm or I can uh, access uh, an existing one. And when you open their development environment, uh, you have the ability to write uh, your Python code here. Uh, and the one thing that's really interesting and good is when you want to look up a stock or something, you type SID. And let's say I wanted to include Apple in this, so I would just type Apple and I would select that. And now I have a reference to Apple's stock in this uh, Python list. And then, so this basic algorithm is going to initialize, it's going to set up and say, these are the securities I'm going to trade. It's going to schedule at the start of every week, on the first day of that week, to rebalance. And every time the market opens, 40 minutes after it opens, for some reason, uh, it's going. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it, it is. There's actually uh, a few years ago a really good article in the Wall Street Journal that uh, they had done some research and I think it, I may be quoting this incorrectly but it was essentially 80% of the volume in the US stock market happens either in the first hour or the last hour. So you'll see a lot of people do analysis uh, around the strategies where they look at trading during that time or just outside of that time. Uh, so it's a really good question. Uh, um, uh, so we have another function that we're going to record some variables iterating through our collection of positions to see how many we have long, how many we have short at any given time. Uh, we'll also record things about our account, uh, in this case the leverage, uh, which is how much am I borrowing to buy and sell. And we'll have one function that basically does our algorithm. It goes and gets a, a pandas uh, data frame of 31 day uh, price information and slices uh, the last 10 days into one frame, the last 30 days into another, get the average, determine the uh, raw weights of how much they're off. Uh, by that, we normalize that amount and then we return that frame uh, to say, hey, this is, uh, you know, I should have this percent in this stock, that percent in this stock, and it'll all add up to 100 percent. Good. Um, and then we have the one thing that's actually going to um, trade our, our stocks and bonds and we're going to make sure that we actually can trade it, you know, the Quantopian's wrapped a lot of really good risk controls into this one method. Can I actually do this? Let's check before I try and uh, then if so, we're going to actually trade. And if we run this, I'll run it for a lot, uh, a much shorter time, uh, or you hit build. This is essentially what their platform does. And so any back testing framework you have should allow you to look and do your historical what if 
and give you some output of, hey, was this a good thing or not? And essentially what we have is a red line, which is uh, the SPY, or just buying something that represents the 500 largest companies in the US, basically doing nothing except just buying something and once and forgetting about it. And the blue line of what we did. Our hello world is not that great. <laughs> there might be some room for improvement here. Um, but it's really good. Uh, to, you just have this ability to iterate and try some things. And, and now you know, all you've done is created a free account, written a little bit of Python code, and you can play around in this space. It's, so to get to this point, just for an example, this took me three years, I think, to get to this point on my own uh, back when I got started. So this blows my mind. You know, this is so wonderful, uh, in my opinion. Uh, so, so this is essentially uh, Quantopia. Now, uh, don't worry about that. Now, I built my own, and even though I went through that pain, I still think there are some strong advantages to building your own, because uh, there's nothing that beats owning uh, and controlling your own stack. There's a lot more flexibility with, with what you can do. Um, there's a great article about why you may or may not want to do this on quantstart.com, which uh, is Michael Hall's Moore's blog. And as the name uh, would in indicate, it is a wonderful place to start. He's done a great job, and he's a really great guy. He's very, uh, always willing to help people, in my experience. So uh, I would highly recommend reading that article if you're interested in building your own, and checking out his blog, uh, quantstart.com. Uh, and, and by the way, uh, Michael nor Quantopian, I don't work with or for any of them, and they're not paying me to say anything. These are truly, honestly, just my opinions. Um, but there's no reason to start from scratch these days like I did. There are at least four backtesting frameworks. Uh, QS Trader is a newer one. Uh, Pi Algo Trade uh, and Pi System Trade are a little bit older. Uh, Pi System Trade focuses on, I think, futures uh, and trading those if you're interested in that, which is a little bit more advanced. Um, and Zipline is actually Quantopian's backtester. That's actually the library behind what I was demoing a moment ago. So if you're actually interested in what did they write you know, to, to create that, it's really cool to read through that code. Um, then there's things like Pyfolio, which help you evaluate the metrics of your strategies. And there's uh, something, I'm not sure if it's pronounced this way, but I call it QtPy lib. And uh, it, it's a very simple uh, Flask dashboard and framework to do live trading on your own. Uh, so there's a lot out there in the Python community uh, to do this type of work if you want to. Um, but th like I said before, the hardest part is getting the data. So you first want to see what your broker offers. Most bro brokers will offer you uh, some data for free, some you have to pay for. You, hopefully that's usually at a, a much discounted rate if it's through the broker, so you always want to start there. But second, you want to look all elsewhere, and I want to warn you that not all sources are equal. For example, Panda's Data Reader, that library is wonderful for getting financial data. Um, but a lot of people use it to get like Yahoo Finance or Google Finance data. And some of these data sets, the free ones especially, have uh, what's called survivorship bias, which is it only has the companies that exist today, which any strategy is going to look really good if it doesn't ever look at all the ones that are not here today, i.e., maybe they went bankrupt. You know? So you want to make sure you have a survivorship free uh, or survivorship bias free data set. Um, Quandle is a really interesting site. It's a marketplace for data. They have free data and paid data, and, uh, and they're a great API. Um, if you're looking to buy data, uh, there are a lot of vendors out there. These are two of the reputable ones. There, I think, are many more that have uh, some in the community have complained about, but these are two that I, I, I've uh, heard people only say good things about, so I, I will say, yeah, that's probably a good place to look. And then if you need live data, uh, DTN IQ's feed is well, one of the more reputable feeds out there, uh, and I would look to them. So how do you get ideas? Because remember, the first step in our process is we have to have ideas. If you're looking for ideas, um, the Quantopian forums are great. Uh, there's something called Quantocracy, which is a blog aggregator where the community votes up articles that we think are you know, interesting or worthwhile. Um, it, it basically uh, looks like this, because I was reading it this morning. Uh, you come out here, and there's something called the Quant Mashup, and it's just this aggregate feed of different uh, blog sites. So if you're looking at what are people researching, or you're looking for people who maybe have similar thoughts or questions or research topics as you, this is another really good place to go. 
Um, and then, of course, there's SSRN if you want to download academic papers. There's ARXIV if you want to see what academics are researching now. You want to see their pre-release research. And books are actually one of the more common uh, uses. And then academic journals as well are also a common source. So where do you go from here? Well, know your motivation. Your motivation might just be research. It might be trading. It might be uh, to manage your retirement account. It might be because you have a social motive. Uh, for example, I'm really interested in finding a data set that shows uh, companies uh, uh, somehow indicates the, their diversity inclusion policies. And I want to research, do companies that have a strong diversity and inclusion policy uh, outperform ones that don't? You know, so it may be, your motivations can be very wide ranging. I would encourage you to sign up on Quantopian because I just don't think there's ever been such a great opportunity and great resource and good community uh, to come together on this topic. So if you've ever had an interest, it's, it's really a worthwhile step. Um, get a brokerage account. You know, a lot of brokerage accounts are free and they offer you a free practice account. So if you've wanted to get into trading but didn't want to co commit your own money, uh, you could look into finding a, a brokerage that would allow you to do that. Uh, um, and then do your research and do your paper trading. Do not write code and just run it with your own money or someone else's money. It, it just doesn't end well. And with that, thank you. Yes.